So Doug Rushkoff is a professor of technology and media at City University of New York, and he writes really about how kind of the virtual world, the kind of digital world has changed society and culture, environment, economics. And he's, he's spoken and written widely the last 30 years, and his most recent book, forthcoming, is called Survival of the Richest. And this book is about the billionaires who have built these bunkers, some of them 15,000 square feet, filled with tennis courts and um, workout centers and ammunition storage and shooting ranges and food storage where they're going to survive when some catastrophic event, you know, a revolution, insurrection, nuclear war, whatever comes. And he's kind of regularly asked to speak to gatherings like this. He says he tries not to do it because he feels bad about it, but this, this was going to be a third of his teaching salary. So he took this gig, but it wasn't the usual speaking engagement because he got there in the middle of some desert retreat, and it was just five billionaires with him, peppering him with questions. Should I get an island or should I go into outer space? Should we be in Alaska or should we be in New Zealand? Should we put our money in Bitcoin? Should we be in Ethereum? But then he said, really, it all came down to this one concern they had, which was we got our armed force already recruited, contracts with Navy SEALs, but what do we do if our money is worthless and we can't control these people? What's to keep them from taking their gun and shooting us? Some of them had ideas like they would put a collar on these guys and they couldn't eat unless this guy took the collar off or they would only they would know the code to the food storage. And what shocked him listening to these people, the most powerful people on the planet, was they had no sense that they could do anything to try to turn the ship around, right? To kind of slow down climate change or shore up democracy, nor any sense of responsibility for the way their products are destroying the earth, right? For the fact that little children are mining the minerals that make this stuff, or they're designing copiers that are just designed to like fall apart. And um, the longer he listened, the more he was very clear that their goal really was an exit strategy, that they want, that they almost kind of welcomed this apocalypse because they just wanted to be isolated and alone. They just wanted to not be bothered by the rest of us. I mean, it's just like so ludicrous and foolish, right? And it's not unlike the rich man in the parable today. I mean, Luke really sets him up kind of as a caricature as well. He's not just rich. The details are really clear. This guy, he is not one of us. He's wearing purple, which is the color of royalty. He's dressing in linen. That's what, you know, the sacred garments would be in the temple. Um, he feasts sumptuously every single day. It's like this wedding banquet every day. But there's no sense that other people are included, no sense that the, you know, like Jesus says, bring in the poor and the lame when you feast, right? No sense that God is the center. It's just this man and this gate, the expectation of the day, kind of Roman patronage system or even, you know, the Jewish scriptures open your hand to the needy would be that this man would be willing to cross the gate and help others. But instead, the next character is Lazarus. And unlike the rich man who's dressed in finery, he's dressed in sores. The animals, the dogs come and lick them. Um, he would beg, he would plead for just a crumb to fall from the master's table. He's totally powerless. The Greek is someone laid him, they placed him at the gate. He, he can't even walk. Someone's placed him there, hopeful that the rich man will take pity on him. He has nothing except what? A name. It's like the only character in the parables. He's, Lazarus, God helps. That's what the word means, right? And maybe we hear the hearkening to the one that Jesus laid. And there's this gate here, and it, as it happens, the men die. And then the rich man, he's in Hades. He's been tormented in flames. And Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham, where he's been comforted, this symbol of hospitality, right? This patron of comfort all through the Hebrew scriptures. And the, you know, the rich man, Lazarus is still his boy right? He's still a servant. And so he says to Abraham, have Lazarus bring me a dip of water so that I can cool my tongue. And Abraham's like, yeah, no, you missed it out. It's too late. This gate no one can cross. And now it's become this huge chasm that you can't, you can't cross. And even though he pleads more, it's too late. So where, where are we in the parable? Because we're, we're really not one of these extremes, right? We're not the rich man, that out of touch, with the billionaire bunker. 
but we're also not the destitute, the poor. We're kind of, we're the good people, right? We're the teachers and the nurses and the shopkeepers. And I bet everybody here, everybody here wants the gap to go away, right? Everybody wants to find a way to bridge the differences and to create a world where everybody has enough. But even that is really difficult, right? We see it every single week when we see folks driving by, walking by, struggling by. Um, we're like the teachers who start the exchange programs, right, to bring kids together from different parts of the city so that they can build bridges and make connections. Some of you may have heard a few weeks ago on This American Life, there was a show called Three Miles, and it was about these two schools. 15 years ago, the teachers decided to have this exchange program. One of the schools, Brooklyn it was at University Heights Public School, one of the poorest high schools in the country, and they were going to have an exchange program with Fieldstone, which is an elite private school in the Bronx, but a very diverse public private school, like 30% of the kids are color, and they're, if you look at their intention, their whole, everything about the school is based around ethics and character and trying to create people who are good world citizens, and the tuition is $60,000 a year. Most of the kids are on scholarship, or many of them, but still. So they started this pen pal program, the kids beginning to know one another, and then they brought the kids together. And what happened was not what the teachers intended. When the kids from the public school got off the bus, a school that has no lunchroom, no advanced math classes, nothing like beyond basic math, and they saw this school up on the hill, 18-acre campus, stone buildings, and these beautiful carved paths, art gallery, and pool, and every class you could imagine. I mean, it was just overwhelming. It was devastating to some of them. One girl, probably the smartest student of any school, she literally crumpled and had this panic attack. We gotta get out of here, we gotta get out of here, we gotta get out of here. And it was just like, it turns out when you see, you know, what's on the other side, and when the gap is so difficult and so hard to bridge, it's really hard. And they followed these students and checked back in 10 years later, and some of them, this experience had truly been debilitating. This brilliant girl who had a world in front of her, she completely gave, it said to her, I'm not even worth anything. Even though she was college bound, she didn't go. I've heard Alex and Christy talk about this. I mean, I remember Alex told me once at UMKC that the average young black male who starts, 16% graduate in six years. I mean, the road to get up and over is really difficult and hard. But interesting, we could give up, but there's a word here, a word that comes out of the rich man's mouth that's a word for me of guidance. When he's finally given up and realized it's too late to him, what does he go to his brothers? And he says, if someone would go to them, they could repent. And Abraham says, well, they got Moses and the prophets. Moses, right now, our Jewish sisters and brothers are in the middle of Deuteronomy, reading the Torah portions leading up to Rosh Hashanah, which begins tonight, the high holiday. And Moses, if you can remember back to Deuteronomy, well, he's about to die. 40 years leading him in the wilderness. So he's laying down the law, literally, right? Commandment, 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 commandment. Remember that one section last week was 72 laws. And he gets through all these laws. And then he says, this is beautiful. This is my favorite passage in scripture. Surely this is not too much for you. It's not too difficult. It's not beyond the heavens. It's not over the seas. It's right there in your heart. You can do this, folks. You can do this. You can love and care and be generous. And then since he knows we're going to screw up, he says seven times to repent right to turn to return i mean that word is in there seven times to shuba the word for repentance and seven of course in hebrew and jewish life it's the holy number it's the way of saying you can keep turning you're gonna screw up you're gonna flub up you're gonna mess up you're gonna set up the program it's not gonna keep keep turning and returning and of course that idea is so central to in christian thought to the idea of repentance right metanoia change of heart change of direction and I keep thinking about that. You know, is there a slight way forward for us now? So tempted are we not to just turn inward, to just push away? I mean, I think COVID, it really, you know, gosh, all that time practicing, keeping our distance and being afraid from people. But is there a way of just trying to practice a little bit of turning towards? I mean, turning towards our lover 
turning towards our kid, turning towards our parent, turning towards our neighbor. And in the scripture and in Jewish faith, you know, when you turn towards, then God does the rest, right? That beautiful rabbinic saying, if you make an opening for repentance, just the size of the eye of a needle, God will open it large enough for wagons and carriages to pass through. I mean, in all of scripture, there's this idea that we just start and then, oh my God, God opens up and gives us a way and helps us move forward. I mean, who hasn't seen that before, right? Where you just try a little bit with someone and then there's this opening. And somehow this mysterious, loving, generous God created us in this beautiful way where what we need to do for our mental health, which is reaching out to one another, is reinforced when we do it, right? I think about those bunkers, not the crazy ones the billionaires are building, but those stories you know you hear about London, World War II, just devastating. They were bombed by the Germans from September through May. I mean, nine months, it was some days, 57 days, 57 days with no letting up. Strikes would kill 600 people like that. And originally, Churchill wasn't even gonna provide any bunkers for the poor or the working class because his opinion of them was so low. And he thought, well, they'll get there, they'll get underground, they'll never come up, you know, they'll just be crazy, wildness. Nothing could have been further from the truth. We read about that Tilbury shelter. People just kind of made it themselves to begin with. 10,000 people together underground, like almost nothing. The conditions were terrible. At first there was like kind of chaos and, and then people pulled together. They set up their own committees. They created laws and ways to be together. Children did art. People found a way to have tea. People went, and you know what? Anxiety, depression, suicide, it went down. Mental health went up. The people who were insane, the neurotics, became the ambulance drivers. You see that over and over and over in situations of war where mental illness and turning away, and people, you know how odd it is that people remember sometimes natural disasters with more favor than their honeymoon? I mean, there's just kind of those weird studies, right? There's something about coming together, the closeness, and even the studies about PTSD, they're telling us more and more, it's not what the soldier sees, it's the community the soldier returns to. Coming home from Afghanistan and Iraq, and everybody's in their phone, and everybody's shopping, nobody knows, what, right? I mean, it's, we gotta turn towards one another. And when we turn towards one another, what happens? It's rich and full and joyful. It's like God has created us in this way that when we turn towards one another, you know, we, we begin to feel the joy and grace of it, and then we can turn towards one another more. When Anita Furch moved to Philadelphia, she had two concerns. Her family she was going to, she was excited about, family she was leaving here. And the other concern that she talked to me about a lot was who was going to do the laundry at Cherith Brook on Monday afternoons. And there was a lot of it because I'm there Monday mornings and who's going to, and so we put out the call. We, anybody want to go to Cherith Brook and be down there in the heat or the cold or whatever doing laundry that's People who've been on the streets, doesn't smell real good. I didn't expect Kay Ward to step up. Brain tumor, right? Brain tumor during the middle of COVID. You know, you've only got, you've only got so much time, right? John McCain, we've seen it before. But Kay Ward, her sister Amy, it didn't matter after a while how bad Kay felt. I mean, I had to tell the people at Cherry Book, she cannot come anymore. She was there doing that laundry not just doing the laundry, being a part of people's lives, reading books with people and loving people and caring people. I've seen a lot of people die since 1983 when I took my first job as a student pastor. Last Sunday, being with Kay, I've never seen someone die at home with that many people. I mean, on Sunday, during the times I would, I bet, I bet there were 20 people in and out of there just on Sunday. And there was a time, you know, they wanted me to pray when I just, the, the love in the room, it was just so overwhelming. I couldn't, I couldn't, and then, then God gave me some words, but just that feeling, right? We don't need people to come back from the dead to tell us what's important, to tell us what's fulfilling, to tell us in the end if we want to be in a bunker all by ourselves, worried about our money, or in a bunker, 
surrounded with God's people. May this rich, good life, may the gift of the scripture, may the sacred gift of one another turn our hearts to God and to the next one we meet. Amen.